Today we're going to be looking at, last week we looked at you know, what is process theology and kind of went over uh, process philosophy and how the development of process thought came about um, and, and how it kind of uh, developed into process theology. Today we're going to be looking specifically at the uh, Christian faith and some of our traditional doctrines and looking at it through the lens of process theology. Okay? And then next week we're going to be looking at uh, how process theology can address some of the challenges of a modern, as in more like 21st century, um, the fact that we live in a much, in many ways, a, a smaller world because uh, we understand that we live in a world where there's a, a pluralism of faiths, right? So uh, one of the things that I know when I was at Claremont, um, they really, uh, in, you know, let us engage is contemplating how to be authentic and to be faithful in our, 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 our own traditions, yet at the same time, uh, don't be obnoxious. And you know, how do you engage um, respectfully and faithfully with other faith traditions, yet be faithful to your own faith tradition? So um, you know, how do you live an authentic Christian faith in a pluralistic world. And that's one of the um, real engagement. And process theology actually does help with that. Um, the other aspect of process theology is it's a very natural um, theology that engages, um, I think it's very relevant today, um, the natural world, environmentalism. Uh, it's pretty much, very much in, um, embedded in this. Um, so we'll be covering those two aspects of it next week. Um, and when we do that, uh, next week's actually going to be a little shorter session because I need to catch a plane right after the class. And so <laughs> I'm going to be out of here by 7.30 next week. But today, we'll, I'll, I'll try to cover a good chunk of the Christian faith. All right? With that, let's join together in prayer. Oh, gracious God, we truly give you thanks uh, for this evening. And as we come together and to begin this, uh, um, our, our second session of understanding uh, just a, a taste, an introduction of uh, process thought, uh, process theology. Lord, we pray for your spirit's guidance and, and your spirit's uh, just uh, um, uh, enlightenment, opening up our hearts and our, our, our minds to be receptive to uh, ways of thinking about our faith uh, from uh, a different way, but a different perspective that can help us continue to grow in our faith. So be with us, and may your spirit be our guide. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, so uh, just a quick uh, recap of last week. Like I said, we kind of looked at uh, the development of process thought, um, starting with Alfred, uh, Alfred Whitehead back in the uh, mid-1800s, uh, uh, 1860 or something like that was when he was born. Um, and then uh, he, was a, he was a professor at Cambridge, a mathematician, uh, then kind of uh, um, his study of mathematics kind of led into philosophy. Uh, and then uh, he, you know, he then came to you know, the University of London and stuff like that. And then he came to the United States, he was a professor of philosophy at Harvard, and that's when he really developed this understanding of process thought. And then um, John Cobb at, at Claremont, uh, well, he was uh, a student of University of uh, Chicago Divinity School. Um, he really uh, got to learn about process thought as he was trying to understand uh, process theology. And for him, you know, he, he was a, uh, a son of mission, uh, Methodist missionaries, and so faith was a big part of his life, but he definitely needed to uh, have a different way of understanding some of the traditional or orthodox uh, doctrines of the Christian faith. And that's how he developed it, came to Claremont, uh, started the uh, Center for Process Studies, and that's how I kind of got uh, to understanding this. So in a quick synopsis, you know, three things um, about uh, process theology. Uh, uh, some of the, the basic assumptions of our Christian faith or, or just faith about understanding of God, you know, process theology kind of uh, has a different perspective, right? So when we look at our understanding of God, uh, there's these basic attributes of God, um, that God is all powerful, that God is um, Omni, omniscient, uh, all-knowing, God is all everywhere, God is omnipresent, and the last one is, of course, uh, that God is uh, omnibene omnibenevolent, or God is love. Um, of that, you know, process theology is, is, is a theology that, under, that, that, that approaches uh, this philosophy, or process thought, through the understanding of time, 
that time is not something that God created, but it is part of the natural world that God works through time. It's not one that God manipulates time. God works through time. And so because of that, you know, just as, as, as we, uh, as much as we love our movies and want to kind of sometimes rewind the clock and go back and see if we could redo something, um, and we know that we can't do that, um, in process theology, God also doesn't go back in time or there's no such thing as going uh, future into time, right? The present is all that is in terms of reality. The past is just uh, memory. The future is unwritten. And so in process theology, God is omnipresent, me meaning that God is in every matter. God is um, present with um, all things. Um, uh, living and non, uh, you know, animate and non, inanimate in the world. God is everywhere, omnipresent. God is omniscient, meaning God knows everything to be known. In other words, God knows everything of the past. God knows everything there is to know right now. But God doesn't know the future because the future hasn't been written yet. And so the whole concept of oh yeah, there is only one timeline and the future is already written, process theology doesn't go there. Process theology says no. If we truly have free will, and it's not a free will that's a, an illusion where God already knows what you're going to do, that's not free will. Um, in process theology, because not only humanity, but all of creation has a certain nature within themselves, to really be authentic to our ability to make our own free choices um, in process theology, God does not know the future. Now there's probabilities of what we may do based upon our habits and our, um, you know, our, our past, but th that's all probability. There's always a probability that we will do something that is unpredictable. And that's being human, right? We do things that you know, my parents, I did things that my parents thought I would never do. So, you know, that's just how it is. And so, uh, in process theology, the future is always open. Um, and so, because of that, um, God only knows what is past and the present, but not the future. And then, of course, um, God's omnipotence, whereas in traditional um, theology, we think of God ha having this, this almighty power to, to do whatever and to be coercive. You know, there's always, the, the, um, I remember, when I was in uh, well seminary, there was this uh, a paradox, right? Can God create a stone so heavy that he couldn't lift? Right? That's a paradox, right? Because if God is truly all powerful, sure, God can create that. But if he can't, if he, if he can't lift it, then is he truly all powerful, right? It's a power. It's, it's one of those paradox. Um, in process theology. It, 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 God's power is not one of, you know, this, this just uh, like to do whatever God wants. God's power is not coercive, meaning God um, uh, manipulates um, uh, the world, uh, especially the natural world, but God's power is persuasive, meaning God, um, in terms of guiding humanity and all living things, God's power is to be persuasive in nudging us, guiding us. You know, we can call, you know, we, we sort of uh, allude to that when we talk about the, you know, the Holy Spirit kind of nudging us. That's the power of God, that God's power is persuasive, not coercive. And um, in, in the Christian context, God's persuasive power is defined by love, that God, uh, God directs all of creation to live out, to act out that which is, um, that exemplifies love of all creation. Um, so, all right. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Sorry, I'm late. It's all right. Oh, I'm just doing a recap, um, just to kind of bring us up to speed uh, from last week. So again, you know, God. So God's power is persuasive, not one that manipulates. Um, and then the last thing, of course, uh, a, a big element of process theology is that God is relational. Right? God is not um, in, in process theology. The concept of God is not some 
deity or a theist, you know, uh, uh, where God created the world and then just kind of left it to be, or or God, um, you know, uh, created the world and then just kind of watches what we do. God is relational. God is completely relational and active in uh, engagement. Uh, in the world, all of nature, but especially from our perspective in humanity, which means that um, God, that, that we're all interconnected, including God, that God feels what we feel when we struggle, when we suffer, God feels that, God knows that. God, um, it's not just God knows what, what we're feeling, God experiences what we're feeling because um, our experience is interconnected with God. And God, you know, God's nature is interconnected with us. We get some of that theology when we talk about, well, God's spirit was breathed into us, right? And so uh, we are not just you know, flesh and bones, but God's spirit within us, and that spirit is interconnected with God. So, so there's that concept, and you know, again, in our theology, we just don't flush it out. And what process theology is trying to do is flush it out, but also then see it from a very logical and natural world, not something that's going to, just going to be completely uh, illogical or disconnected. Part of the study of theology is to be consistent in our thinking and not just you know, chuck some thought or a theory and say, well, you know, we can't explain it, so, but you have to accept it with blind faith. You know, process theology is like, no, no. It's like a part of are growing in our faith is to grapple with it. Whether, even if it means it's hard to conceive or understand at any time, part of our growing in our Christian faith is that we are grappling with it, wrestling with it. And that actually comes from our, um, uh, our Jewish heritage because uh, in Judaism, faith is uh, likened to the story of uh, Jacob when he wrestled with God you know, when he got, first got the name Israel, um, and because that wrestling. And so part, uh, being a person of faith means wrestling, wrestling with understanding. To not wrestle, to say, oh yeah, I know what, um, what my faith is and, and I know how, how God works. You know, that's not faith. <laughs> so anyhow, so that's the, um, a recap, quick recap of, of last week. So today we're going to be looking at our, um, our, of how, uh, asking the question of how process theology engages with our Christian faith. And we're going to start off well, with the very beginning, uh, God's creative order. Um, we, we know that you know, our, when we open up our sacred text, our scripture, um, the very first story in there is the creation story, right? Great story. Um, I always try to teach people that the creation story was not written when creation happened, right? whether it happened that way or not. Right? It was written like in uh, in the 600 B uh, BC, uh, 650 BC, or, or well, during the time of the Babylonian exile after 586 BC. Uh, it was a way for for the the, the leaders of the uh, the Jewish faith, the, the Israelite faith, uh, to encourage the people of Israel who were um, exiled into Babylon, as they were living in the Babylonian culture, they were losing their identity. They were forgetting who they were as the people of Israel, and so the creation story was developed to tell the story that. Again, back in those days, they thought that every nation had their own gods, and that whenever there was war and battles, the gods fought, fought against each other, right? And whoever won, you know, that god won, and, and whoever lost, you know, sometimes they um, thought that their god died, you know, or was completely defeated. Well, the creation story was developed for two things, two reasons. One, to show that there is no such thing as my god versus your god, that there is only one god, god of all creation. Okay, that's the first lesson that, that this story was trying to teach. The second thing was for the people of Israel, in order to help them identify or keep their identity of who they were that was different than the other people of the other nations, one of the characteristics of, of the Jewish faith is, well, there's two things that's very characteristic of the Jewish faith, right? One, uh, men had to be circumcised. 
Uh, it's not something that you go around flashing and saying, hey, look, I'm Jewish, you know? Uh, <laughs> the other thing was the very practice of observance of the Sabbath, mm -hmm. right? Observance of the Sabbath was a key indicator of their identity, and so the creation story was developed so that that was part of their story, so that they was, was, a, was um, to teach and to encourage. What did God do after God created everything in six days? What did God do on the seventh day? God rested. And so it was a story developed to encourage uh, the Jewish community that don't be, don't be discouraged. You know, our God didn't lose from any other God. There's no such thing as God's fighting against God's because there's only one God of all creation. And two, in order to uh, keep their identity, to observe the Sabbath. So that's how the Genesis 1 story came about. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of people just kind of either don't realize that or they take it very literally, right? So one of the challenges um, uh, 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 since the 1800s, uh, 1900s um, is, you know, ever since uh, Darwin uh, developed, uh, uh, wrote um, his um, theory of evolution. <laughs> Yeah, the theory of um, evolution, there has always been this argument, right? There's arguments between science and faith on the debate between creationism and evolution, right? And, and of course, creationists uh, stuck to this literal reading of Genesis 1, which explained, you know, yeah, it's not quite what it was talking about. But unfortunately, there's that assumption, right, that uh, uh, the, the creation is that this is how it is. And it, it kind of is based upon this almost this. Again, a very supernatural, that it, again, uh, if you're a strict creationist, the world, the universe was created in six days, yeah. six 24-hour days. The Big Bang Theory? Oh, uh, uh, I'll get to the Big Bang Theory. Um, creationist goes beyond just the Big Bang. The Big Bang happened, but everything got created in six days, boom, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, there's variations to that. Um, there are uh, uh, creation. Uh, there, there are creationists um, who believe that that God uh, that that it uh, the six days are correct, but God's days are different than human days, and could be six millennia or whatever. Da, 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 da. So that's there's a variation to that. And then there's all, then there's the understanding um, that uh, uh, um, that evolution is a part of God's creative work. That evolution is one of the processes that God develops. Now, as we talk about evo um, um, evolution or creation, one of the one of the assumptions in classical theolo Christian theology is the concept of um, ex nihilo, creation ex nihilo. In other words, God created the world out of nothing, okay? God created the world out of nothing. That before there was even time, that was before there was any matter, God existed and God is the one that created all matter and, and you know, including time, right? It, 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 again, it, 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 it gives the depiction of this all-powerful God that creates everything. Interesting thing is, when you do read Genesis, it doesn't say that, right? Genesis 3, or Genesis 1, verses, the first three verses says, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the world, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind from God, call it the spirit, swept over the face of the waters. So, you know, and then and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Was, there, was it truly nothing when God created the heavens and the earth? According to scripture, right? right? Again, not to say that we're trying to read this literally, but the whole concept is that um, the, the, the theory of ex nihilo, that God created um, everything out of nothing, is a, 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 is a ph uh, theology that got developed later on as they were trying to uh, uh, depict God as this all-powerful that controls everything. <laughs> Process theology reads this and says, the way God creates, it's not necessarily ex nihilo. 
Um, but God creates with what is already existing. Now, you can say, well then, okay, so where did the stuff come from? You know, there has to be a beginning point somewhere. Process theology says, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something that process theology deals with. Why? Because Big Bang Theory, right, and again, much of science kind of subscribe to uh, the Big Bang Theory. The understanding of Big Bang Theory is that time started with the Big Bang, that's the beginning of everything, and then from the Big Bang, all these matter um, kind of sp sp splurted out, and then um, it, it expanded through, time, um, through the universe, and as matter started to spread out, that was actually time that was developed through the Big Bang, right? Process theology doesn't try to explain, well, did God create the Big Bang, or what, what, what existed before the Big Bang, or process theology, uh, even Alfred Whitehead, um, is like, that's, you know, that, that's beyond us. It's not, it, great if we know it, but it's not gonna do anything for us, so it doesn't really deal with that. It's, yeah, it's like, is it that important? There'll be other things that I'll ask, is it really important? But, um, yeah, it's not that important. What's important is trying to understand in terms of our faith and our engagement, well, after the Big Bang, as the world is evol evolving, how does God work, interact with us? <laughs> Evolution versus God. Top documentary films, ooh, okay. Siri, she's trying to get into the conversation. Uh, <laughs> But according to the Big Bang Theory, you know, as it started from one point and um, uh, matter just exploded out and it's continuing to move out, one of the natural theories in science and physics is called the theory of entropy, right? You learn this in physics, right, in science. And the theory of entropy is that the natural order of the universe is towards chaos, right? Everything just moves towards chaos. Right? So Big Bang, it started in this, I don't know what it was, we don't know, um, but as things move out, things get more chaotic, things spread out. You know, uh, 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 a practical example of that is like anyone's home, right? If you don't do anything about it, what happens to your home? It becomes chaos. <laughs> it becomes chaos. It naturally, it's like it naturally becomes messy, right? <laughs> the natural order of the world is that it becomes more chaotic. That's just, you know, and that's, that's one of the, the, the natural laws of physics, that everything moves towards chaos. Yet, yet, life, as life developed, life is complex, right? Life is complex and the structures of life, right? The DNA, you know, I, one of my favorite um, um, scientists is, um, uh, Francis Collins, right? The, the, uh, he just retired. He was the director of um, the National Institute of Health. Uh, he was the presidential advisor to, uh, I think, President Bush. Um, uh, for those who don't know Francis Collins, I, I tell people, well, you know Dr. Fauci? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's his boss. <laughs> um, he is the one who mapped the human genome, the genetics. Mm -hmm. He grew up as an atheist agnostic, pretty much an agnostic. His father was an atheist, um, but he told him to go to church, not to learn anything about what the church is teaching, but because that was the only place um, when he was younger that uh, taught music. Oh. So he went to church to learn music. During his college years, you know, he was agnostic, didn't care about all that, and, and was you know, very much into science. It was when he was studying genetics and realize our genetic code, how it works, mm -hmm. it's not random. Yeah. <laughs> there is some order to how life works. And from the natural theory of entropy, it doesn't work this way. So what he and science says is something is bringing order out of chaos. Something. Because the natural thing is to go completely into chaos, mm -hmm. but if everything just goes into complete into chaos, there wouldn't be planets or life, mm -hmm. organisms. 
humans. It doesn't work but in, the, in the pure natural science. Something is bringing order into chaos, and that is, for Francis Collins, he is a devout Christian. He became a person of faith through his study of science, genetics. You know, and then and, and he goes around saying, you know, there are those who study you know, science and, 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 and refute all of faith, but that's because they only learned it up to here. <laughs> Once you really learn science, you come to a point where you realize there is more to here. You know, it, it's, 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 it's that um, adage, right? The more you learn, the more you realize, the less you, right, the more, the more you learn, the, more you, yeah, the less you know, right, or something like that, right? You know that phrase, right? Exactly. That something is much bigger. So anyhow, that's the story of Francis Collins. And we see this, this, that the world, in the midst of chaos, God brings things into order. Or God's continual work is to bring order out of chaos. Right? It's a tough job, yeah. It's a tough job. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at biblical history, right? Mm -hmm. The biblical history is all about, in the beginning, was just chaotic. Now, it doesn't try to explain how it got so chaotic with the people, right? Like, you know, to the, um, uh, this is a little depiction of artwork of um, how humanity was during the time of Noah, which was, you know, chaotic, right? But the biblical story that we learned, the, the, the arc of um, the salvific, the, what, what do you call it? The sal salvific arc of um, the Bible, of scripture, the story in the Bible is that humanity was in chaos. And so the story in the Bible is that then God calls upon, you know, the first stories of God trying to bring order out of chaos was to call Abraham, makes a covenant saying, follow me, and, I'll, uh, and, 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 and we will transform the world. Well, we all know the story that Abraham was, yeah, okay, he did the best he could, um, but his children, you know, got kind of, it, with each generation, it got worse and worse, right? Chaos, right, entropy, we kind of tend towards um, um, more chaotic, and so then God resets again, calls Moses, gives him the laws to, um, to, to, to guide the people into a structured society. But then again, you know, uh, that kind of guided people for a while. And, and as uh, the people of Israel developed, you know, they start to stray away again. You, you know, read, you read the stories in, um, um, in uh, Joshua and Judges and how chaotic it became, and then they built it, you know, they started having their own kings and monarchs, they wanted to be like everyone else, and more and more, the people strayed away again from an ordered society, and so then God sends prophets to, you know, speak to the monarch, to bring people back, and, and, and so you can, you, what, what the Bible story, it, the, the, you know, in a, you know, you know 30,000 feet, you know, view of the, the Bible story, it's about God continuing to help to bring about order in a chaotic humanity, right, over and over again. And so finally, after the prophets, you know, come around and, and try to uh, tell the people to stop living, uh, creating a society of injustice and violence, you know, I always say, God finally said, ah, <laughs> right, to the people, and said, wait right there, I'll be right down. <laughs> And so then God manifests in Jesus. That's the arc of the, the, the biblical story of how God is, God is striving to, to create order out of the chaos. In process theology, that's how we read it through process theology. That it's not that, oh yeah, from the beginning God had in mind that, yeah, I'm going to come you know, uh, uh, as Jesus and then you know, die on the cross uh, for the salvation of the world. No, it was a development. It was a development over time, you know? If the people all shaped up after receiving the Ten Commandments, great! But it didn't work that way. So history, God works through the, 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 the raw materials of nature. But God's persuasive guidance is, is working through what the raw materials to bring that order. Okay, so then, yes, God manifests in Jesus. So who is Jesus? How do we understand Jesus through process theology? 
Okay, right? Because so much of our, our doctrine of Jesus kind of gets a little dicey. It's kind of hard to explain sometimes, right? Problems with classical doctrine. Um, the Nicene Creed was developed, uh, uh, well, Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, right? So fourth, fourth century. And it, the, the, during that council, um, they were, basically you had a bunch of you know, old guys, um, church fathers that got together, and there were all these different thoughts and different the theories or theologies of who Jesus was. And as a way for the church to kind of say, oh, you know what, no. We want everyone to believe this. They developed the Nicene Creed, okay, that all the churches are supposed to um, subscribe to. Now, from the Nicene Creed, which is a much longer creed, um, we have the Apostles' Creed. That was the, the Cliff Notes version, right, the shortened version that I think a lot of us haven't memorized just because of our upbringing. Yeah. But as we recite the Apostles' Creed, there are things in there that in the Nicene Creed that you know, 20th century, 21st century modern science says, you know, some of that stuff, that's pretty hard to swallow, right? And one of the basic, basic, you know, uh, uh, doctrines of Jesus is the virgin birth, right? That's one of the big things, you know, that's part of Jesus. Jesus had to be born of a virgin because Mary well, uh, you know, this was before Mary and Joseph had any sexual uh, uh, marital relations, right? And, and so she, Jesus was born of virgin birth. Of course, if you've been to some of our earlier classes, you know that the Immaculate Conception refers to Mary, not Jesus, that Mary was also born of a virgin, that Mary's mom, St. Anne, also gave birth to Mary, Mother Mary, uh, without any father, and so that Mary was a, vir a virgin birth, so that Jesus could be doubly, <laughs> doubly clean, right? Um, because, in, and again, that theology was developed because St. Augustine had a big thing about uh, sexual relations, and so he wanted to make sure that Jesus was twice removed from anything that depicted being tainted by sin. That's a taint. Right? So, but, but, <coughs> This virgin birth concept, as much as it is part of um, classical Christian doctrine, it has also then caused a lot of, it's been a stumbling block for a lot of people, right? Now, for most of us, for some of us, for me, I'm like, oh yeah, virgin birth, sure. Uh, do you believe it? Maybe, I don't know. Does it matter? I don't, it doesn't matter for me, okay? Why doesn't it matter? I understand why the, the virgin birth story was so important during the time of its development. We know because it was the culture back then, right? The Greek mythologies, right? The virgin birth story is not unique to Jesus. It existed for hundreds of years prior to that in the, uh, the Greek mythologies, the Roman mythologies, right? You have the, the demigods, right? Hercules and Perseus and, and uh, you know, these other um, children of God who were born because the gods would kind of flirt with the humans down here and then they would have children. And these children would become the heroes, right? Uh, of, of the day, right? And so, you know, Hercules and Perseus and all of them, yes. The, the, it was the signature of what it meant to be a hero, right? To be born of a virgin. And I understand, back in the day, because that's what it took for the people to, uh, to, to accept that someone would be a hero, that concept was added on to the understanding of Jesus. Do we need that now? Eh. Some people do, some people don't. If you believe in the uh, virgin birth, great. If you don't, that's fine too. What I say is, I always ask, is it important <laughs> to your faith, right? In, in process theology, it doesn't deal with it. But it does deal with the other concept of um, the Nicene Creed, which says that Jesus is 100% human and 100% God, right? 
So yes, you know, a demigod would be half god and half human, but that's 50-50, right? And one of the challenges of, of modern people is, you know, when you add 100% plus 100%, you don't get one, right? You get two, <laughs> right? 100 plus 100, so mathematically, it doesn't work. And of course, uh, Alfred Wrighthead being a mathematician, one of the first things is like, boy, that doesn't make sense, right? Our understanding of Jesus being 100% human, 100% God, it, 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 the way we've been explaining it all along doesn't work. It's not natural. So in, in process theology, it views Jesus as truly being 100% human and truly being 100% being God, but not in a physical sense. Not in a way where you go around adding 100% plus 100%. It's, it's like the doctrine of the Trinity, right? Another Christian doctrine that nobody can figure out, right? And throughout, I mean seriously, as, as, you, as you've learned about the Trinity, what has usually been the, the, uh, the default explanation for the Trinity? Well, three in one, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, don't worry about it. Just accept it, right? Just accept it. You'll never understand because it's, it's, it's about God and God is beyond our comprehension, so you'll never understand, right? Well, that's, yeah, that's just like how Jesus is 100% human, 100% God. You know, the Trinity is another concept that just doesn't make sense, right? That Jesus is the Father, or, or Jesus is not the Father, Jesus is not the Holy Spirit, um, and that the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and yet the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is one God, right? Mathematically, that doesn't work either. Right? So how does process theology understand um, who Jesus is? While still saying, okay, you know what? The Trinity and the understanding that Jesus is 100% God and 100% human, there's a different way of looking at this. That, 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 that those doctrines can still be true and yet viewing it from natural science. You think natural science, that's where it doesn't work, right? The one plus one doesn't work. Well, again, going back to our understanding of process theology, how God works, right? We're not talking about God as being coercive and forcing people to do what, you know, what, what we do. That God's nature is to be persuasive, right? that God guides and that at any given moment, right, the red dot is any moment, um, say it's us, we have, at any given moment, we have decisions to make, choices, our free will. And that choice that we make is a result of all the different influences in our lives, right? Our past history, our habits, uh, other people around us, our environment, and the yellow line, God. God's nature, right? God's persuasive influence, God's persuasive love directs us and guides us. Call that the Holy Spirit, right? It nudges us to go in God's direction. But we have all these arrows, <laughs> right? And given our true free will and free choice, we sometimes pick this one, or something like this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, right? And yes, there's probabilities of all this, and God could, can, is a great mathematician, he can, God can, you know, can calculate all that, but ultimately, you know, how we're gonna choose, it's up to us, right? So all of us, at any given moment, have all these influences. The goal is to, follow the persuasive guidance of the Spirit of God. For Jesus, Jesus is the full embodiment. For Jesus is the one who, even though there were all these other influences, always and only did what was aligned with God's nudge, persuasive love. So God is the, Jesus is the full embodiment of God's 
per persuasive love. And because he is the full embodiment of God's persuasive love, everything that he did was the will of God. And in that sense, he was, his actions was 100% human. His essence was 100% human. Jesus was fully aligned with God's nature, even though he was human, right? Um, and therefore, God is the full incarnation of God. The word incarnation, right? We, we talk about this during the Christmas time when Jesus is born, because you know, the, the, the classical Christian theology is that God, you know, uh, took off his heavenly robe and then was born as a baby through Jesus, right? So that's, a, that's, the, that's the classical theology of um, uh, orthodox theology of who Jesus is. Well, in, in process theology, it doesn't get into all that because technically, you know, the Bible stories don't really define that. We just kind of add it to the story when, because of our Christmas traditions. In process theology, Jesus, in his actions, was truly the embodiment of God's will. Now, this doctrine of Jesus being 100% human and 100% God is critical in classical theology because of salvation. All right? The question is, well, how does salvation work through Jesus? And especially in process theology, you know, how does it work? So in classical theology, when we talk about um, salvation, we're talking about atonement, right? Which basically means, uh, well, the word atonement can be broken down to at one meant. Right? So, the, the, so the, the, the theories or the theology of atonement is about how, uh, how does God bring us to be at one with God again, right? Whether it be in essence or in our life, in our will, right? For Jesus, Jesus was already in line with God and you know, uh, part of our atoning, um, our redemption is for us to live in ways that aligns with God's will, right? Um, in classical theology, there are three theories of atonement. The most common nowadays, um, and this was, this is something of a later development since like the Middle Ages, not the Middle Ages, uh, more like the 17, 1800s is when this concept of substitutionary theory has become more prevalent. Um, and this is the, the theory, it's a substitution theory that, again, a, a lot of times our, our, our other branches of Christianity kind of focus on. The substitutionary theory of atonement basically says that the price of sin is death, so we should be the one that, that dies, or we should be the one that should have been crucified on the cross, but Jesus dies in our place on the cross, right? That's what the substitution theory um, says. And because Jesus dies in our place, that we have eternal life, right? That's the substitution, that we deserve death, we deserve damnation, we deserve to go to this place called H, I don't know, down there. Um, but, you know, but God saves us because Jesus took our place. That's the substitutionary theory. The second theory is the ransom theory, right? That, that the price of our um, um, lawlessness, the price of our sinfulness is uh, that there's a price tag on that and that um, because of that price tag, um, our life is in debt, right? And that's why we, in the, um, one of the translations for the Apostles' Creed, not the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer is forgive us of our yes. debts, right? We use the word trespasses, but you know, um, uh, some churches say, forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who are dead against us. It's, it's that ransom theory that there's a cost and that Jesus is dying on the cross, that Jesus was the sacrifice, the, the pure sacrifice, and that it paid for um, our, our sins. Now, so going back to why is it so important that Jesus is 100% human and 100% God? Well, in order for that sacrifice to be pure and, and, and to be able to pay for all of humanity, just like in the Jewish tradition, um, the sacrifice had to be unblemished, right? And so for Jesus to be the perfect,
perfect Lamb of God. Jesus had to be God because he had to be perfect. Nobody is perfect except God. <laughs> However, Jesus had to be human because he had to die on the cross. Because gods can't die, right? So that's where this theology kind of gets all messed up. Now, some of you are thinking that is a bunch of baloney, but okay. But that's part of the theology, right? The problem with these two theories, uh, substitutionary theory and ransom theory, is that they're both based upon a penal system, yeah. right? That, 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 that humanity is so bad that you know, Jesus or God had to save us by either dying in our place or paying the, this huge you know, loan forgiveness program for us, right? Mm -hmm. There's a third concept of atonement that is not often talked about although it's the oldest of the atonement theories. Early, in, um, early Christianity um, viewed atonement in a very different way. And it's called the moral influence theory. And the moral influence theory is not about Jesus dying on the cross to pay for our sins or to, uh, to, to, to be our substitute. But the moral influence theory says that Jesus is the very act of knowing that, you know, what he was doing, um, going around preaching love and healing people and eating with outcasts and stuff like that, that upset the establishment at the time, knowing that it was still, uh, it was upsetting the establishment and that it would get him in trouble, Jesus still did what was right because that was the direction of God. Right? Mm -hmm. To love people even if it meant yeah. his own life. Right? And so Jesus did that. And because Jesus did that, not that Jesus was a, 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 a masochist and he wanted to die on the cross. No. You know, it's not like Jesus planned on dying on the cross. That Jesus knew that, yeah, that, that is a very possible uh, cost of being an advocate for you know, the outcast and the people that Jesus continued to do what he did in terms of loving, preaching, teaching, caring for the people, which ultimately did um, get him, uh, lead him to being crucified. But because of Jesus' act, that act influences others. The disciples lives were changed because of what Jesus did. And the disciples of the disciples, as they told the stories of Jesus, their lives were changed. And that's what the moral influence theory says, is that by Jesus' action, it transforms the world. And through that transformation, you know, we are atoned, or uh, we become, we follow what Jesus how Jesus lived, and therefore we learn to align ourselves, become one with God's direction. That's what the moral influence theory says. And in process theology, that's exactly what um, the process theologians are saying. That the process of our salvation is not some formula or calculation, but it is a process. The way we are, we, we we uh, grow in our discipleship, the way we um, are transformed in our lives and how we transform the world, it's not a simple, you know, check this off, check this off, check this off, and then it's, not, it's a process. And this process is not clear, but the process of trying to bring order out of a chaos, chaotic world. And so that's what process theology says is how salvation comes about through Jesus. Jesus' very act as being the one who was truly the embodiment, the full embodiment of, of God's persuasive love spreads and influences the world. So then, um, quickly, what, what is the role of the church? You know, how do we understand church in process theology? How do we understand, um, uh, and then the very last question, eschatology. So the role of the church, 
um, in understanding Christ, uh, Christian thought in this way is that everything from worship and discipleship, when we worship, you know, there's, there's this um, thought that says, um, you know, some people view worship as, you know, it's all about coming before God and bowing down before God and, and, and worshiping God because that's what we are called to do to appease God. Um, process theology doesn't look at worship that way. In fact, uh, I, I hope that most of us don't see uh, coming to worship as uh, a burden. <laughs> that we come to worship because, oh, we have to pay our dues because this is what God wants. And so uh, by doing this, you know, it's, it's like aesthetic, right? Um, uh, by doing this, we're, we're going to um, appease God and, 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 you know, God won't, uh, you know, zap us. Um, worship is not about appeasing God. Worship is about coming in line with God's direction. Again, that, that big yellow arrow coming in line. When we come together in worship, we, uh, we open ourselves to be more receptive to the guidance of God. When we come together as the, the community of faith, as a community, we come together and align with each other because, again, God is not solitary or isolated, but God is relational. And our faith is relational with each other. And so church is about coming together so that we can align ourselves and to be more attentive and to be more open to the persuasive, persuasive love of God. That's why we worship. It's not to, you know, feel bad about something during the week and come before God and say, I'm sorry. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> I'll explain prayer in a bit. <laughs> um, it's not about, you know, uh, uh, begging God to forgive us why we worship. No. Why we worship is so that we can be more open, open to God's direction. Discipleship is the same way. Why do we learn? Why is it so important that we read scripture and study and come together as a class and have discussions? It's because by doing that, we are opening up our minds. We are opening ourselves so that we become more receptive to God's persuasive guidance and not be so fixed in our way of thinking. Right? And so that's why we, uh, discipleship is so important. Service and mission is important. Why? Because in process theology, God is not a, a coercive God that's, okay, there's a problem in this world, we'll pray to God about it, and God will fix it. <sighs> that's not how God works, right? Sometimes we wish that, but that's not how God works. When there is suffering and pain, how does God address those suffering and pain? Through the people through God's persuasive guidance upon those who are open to God's persuasive guidance to go and attend to the suffering and the struggles of the world. We are called to service. We are called to mission because we are, again, we've heard those phrases before, we are the hands and feet of God. God's, God's power is to persuade us into God's direction, but we are the, the tools, the agents that make that happen. We are not, you know, uh, in process theology, we don't just sit back and say, God, I'm just going to be faithful to you. I'm going to praise you all day, but you take care of it. That's not, that's not how God works in process theology. Because, again, it's the, the process is in that relational aspect that, that, that we are connected with God, and God is connected with us, and God uses us to bring about healing um, uh, and redemption into the world. Prayer. Why is prayer important? And I kind of alluded to this last week, right? Um, uh, uh, Margie Swaki, um, my process theology professor at Claremont, she's big on prayer. Um, and the reason why she's big on prayer is because she, she also makes fun of prayer because when people pray, thinking, if you pray hard enough, then God will take care of it. You know, that, that whole thing, right? 
And in process theology, that's, that, that's not how God works. So then what you would always say is, well, if God, okay, again, if in, in the classical theology, if God is all powerful and God is the one that was capable of, of making things happen um, supernaturally, uh, and all we need to is, do is pray about it and God will take care of it, then why doesn't God do it without us to pray? You know, why does God, what's the purpose of our praying if God already has the power to do it and God's going to do it anyway, and if God's not going to do it, then why wouldn't God do it if God is good? <laughs> you know? So the whole concept of prayer gets really messy in our classical theology. But in process theology, the way prayer works is twofold. One, just like worship, Prayer is how we open us up, right? We align ourselves, we open ourselves to what God um, um, leads us, nudges us to address the needs of others. But prayer in terms of intercession, where intercessory prayer, where we pray for other people, where we pray for the world, where, where we pray for other things, the reason why that's important is because in our interconnected process theology, when we pray, we also have that, that nature of God that adds to God's persuasive um, uh, nature. So it basically becomes a collective influence onto the world. So um, the, the story that, um, Marjorie Swalke would tell, uh, I remember uh, in, the, uh, in one of my classes was, when she goes on a trip and gets on the plane, <laughs> right? Um, she says, she prays for the pilot. <laughs> she doesn't just pray for, Lord, get me to my destination safely. No, she prays for the pilot. And by praying for the pilot and the crew or whatever, the mechanics and all, what she says, what she's doing, and she's being that funnel, she's being, uh, by her, through her prayers, she's adding to the persuasive love, the persuasive guidance that God is already directing towards that pilot, right? But then, you know, the pilot's not Jesus, so he has all these other, you know, influences affecting him, but through her prayers, she's adding one more arrow to be aligned with God's. You get it? Mm -hmm. So that means that the more people pray, there's more arrows kind of directing them along the same trajectory as God's. That's how prayer works in process theology. So in prayer, that's why, was, that's why she, you know, she, we say there's power in prayer. That power is not some supernatural, just, you know, like God just like, boom, you know, you know. Some, some magical thing, but it is all part of the connective energy or force, you know, Star Wars, I don't know. <laughs> but there is this natural way in which, again, God is present, God directs, and, through, and our prayer just kind of comes along with God's persuasive love to help that individual to act in ways that is along, um, you know, alignment with God's direction. So that means that what we do, what all that any of us do, has big effects. You know, the stuff that we do, it's not just about me, myself, and I. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do connects with other people. We affect each other. Last thing. Eschatology, okay? No, I know, it's a big word. What is eschatology? End times, right? Mm -hmm. what, so what is process eschatology? What, what, what does the end time look like? What, 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 you know, what, what is the afterlife if you understand process theology this way? Uh, you, you know, are we gonna get wings? Or, you know, is there a pearly gate up there? You know, stuff like that. Again, process theology was developed from a very natural, uh, trying to incorporate natural science, right, with, our faith, our Christian faith. So to think that after we die, we're gonna go up like I don't know, a couple miles, mm -hmm. right? And that there's gonna be this pearly gate. Oh, we know that's 
That's a metaphor, right? It's not, there's no pearly gates, you know, 50 miles up. No. Right? Is it a different dimension? We don't know. But again, process theology, we don't know what the future is. We don't know what the future is. So if we don't know what the future is, then, ooh, that's, now, now all of a sudden it got scary, right? One of the aspects of traditional classical theology is that, well, you know, you have those, you know, uh, Book of Revelation or this, this, this fiction that there's heaven and there's this pearly gates and the reason why, you know, you read some of the passages of the pearly gates and then, and then the golden streets and you, you'll get this house and, and the, more, the better you are, you get these crowns in heaven, you know, things like that. Well, okay, it's, it's kind of, you're trying to entice the people, <laughs> right, to, to strive for this heaven. Is that how it is? No. But at least it gives people a vision of uh, something that's nice for the future. Process theology admits we don't know what heaven looks like. I haven't been there, you know? Uh, we don't know what the future is. But there are, if you really think about the, the, the nature of process thought, and the fact that creation itself, right, is not that God is manipulating the world, but God is truly existent in the world because we know in a natural world where everything's supposed to go be chaotic, that there is something that is bringing order out of chaos, that the future we don't, even though we don't know what the future is and we can't predict the future, what that, traje what that trajectory shows is that there is the, whatever, that whatever that future is, is something good. Because God is continually working to bring order out of chaos. Process theology don't try to you know, paint it as being pearly gates or, or, or streets of gold, but we know that it's a place where there will be a new possibility. It's something that is going to be open to where God guides us. And as long as we are aligning ourselves with God, that future is bright. Right? It's not about being scared or being, you know, or punching a ticket to get into this, 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 you know, so this special club. It's about a possibility that is we don't know, but it is bright. Why? Because God's nature is to bring order out of chaos. It's, we're, we're going to be part of God's eternal creative nature. So when we die, yes, you know, the natural processes, our bodies will decay and stuff like that. But as we are, live our lives here on earth, striving to align ourselves with God, our nature then comes together with God. So whenever, so what, you know, when the time comes and we, our, our bodies perish on this earth, our eternal nature aligns itself with God fully. And so then we experience what God experiences all throughout, forever. That's the concept of process theology. And in that sense, it's an eternity of what God's persuasive direction is. Love Joy, peace. And that's what the future is. Amen? Amen. Questions? <laughs> I was like, oh, this is a different way of teaching. Okay, I have a question. That's a great, that's a great future if uh, we're going to be living in love, joy, and peace for all eternity. Exactly. What else do you want? Party gates? Yeah. <laughs> Valerie. Okay. So if perfectly aligned with God, uh -huh. then eternal life, then if God experiences what you experience and God experiences sorrow, then would you be experiencing that also? Yes. No. You're saying, well, that's not good, is it? I mean, if you're one with God, then you're experiencing what God is experiencing for the... For, for all of humanity at that time, right? Yeah. 
So you experience what God experienced. But remember, as we continue to move forward, God is bringing order out of chaos. Part of our suffering, as horrible as we don't want to suffer, a part of life is overcoming suffering, right? And there is that sense of joy as long as we're going the right direction, right? So you experience that. So again, going back, do you experience the suffering or the pains of the world by being one with God in the afterlife? Now, I don't know for sure because I'm not there yet, but <laughs> my answer to that, my guess is yes, because we will be part of God's full understanding of the world. And ultimately, all of that is moving in the right direction. And we'll be part of that journey in the right direction. And maybe it looks to us like chaos, <laughs> but it really isn't chaos. It's moving slowly. It's slow, right? Exactly. But the whole idea, again, it's called process theology because it's not about the end game. It's about the process. So in the process, okay, we still have, we have Christ who came. We went through the history and Christ who came because there was chaos on the earth. Explain the second coming of Christ. Explain the second coming of Christ. Okay, so the second coming of Christ, not in the literal sense, not in the literal. but in the metaphorical sense, okay. The second coming, as described in scripture, um, remember the whole concept of the rapture mm -hmm. is not biblical. It's not in the Bible of rapture, mm -hmm. right? Um, the, the concept of the second coming, as if you read like Revelation 20, it talks about the second death and stuff like that. Um, the second coming is about the full, uh, so the first coming of Christ was, of course, Jesus. This is, I'm going back to classical theology. Mm -hmm. The classical theology says the first coming is Jesus came and, and died on the cross for our salvation, right? And then the second coming of Christ comes when uh, Jesus uh, establishes the kingdom of God here on earth. This is classical theology, right? In process theology, um, well, for, for one, it doesn't really, uh, there's not a lot of writing on the second coming of Christ, <coughs> but the second coming of Christ, the concept of that is that the kingdom of God is going to be established. We experience the kingdom of God. That's what the second coming of Christ is all about. So now, thinking in terms of process, we experience the kingdom of God when we align ourselves and live in this, this eternal state of love, joy, and peace. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. 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 From my corner of the room, the, the rituals we go through really aren't necessarily, they're only useful if they remind us to get in alignment. Yes, mm -hmm. and the rituals are useful to help us. Yeah, yeah because mm -hmm. like, for example, um, I'm thinking of example. <laughs> uh, I go to the gym. Right? There's a bunch of apparatus everywhere. And I could be like, ah, I feel like doing that. I feel like doing that. And I can try doing that, but it's not really as productive. But when I, but when I had a, a personal trainer, he would put me on a certain schedule. schedule, cycle, which was very productive. Right? Same thing with the rituals of the church. The, the idea of the rituals is not that the ritual itself is salvific. But the rituals are guidance to help us focus. It doesn't surprise me that, um, but did you talk, talk about process? Because teachers have been doing process <laughs> since the time. That's sure. Our mantra. Yeah. It's the process. Right. Period. Uh huh. Not just the answer in the back of the book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Learn how to. Work through it. Yeah. Hey, Dave. Uh, the engineer was talking. He says, you know, every engineer make order out of chaos. That's what engineering is all about, about to make order out of chaos. 
The lawyer said, where do you think all that chaos came from? The engineers. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer said, where do you think that chaos came from? <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer said. <laughs> Good job. Anyhow, well, thank you for joining me. I can tell that gears are turning and this is going to keep you up a little late at night, but <laughs> hey, it's all part of the process of growing. <laughs> it's process. <laughs> That's right. So next week we'll cover um, process theology as it uh, attains, uh, attends to um, uh, understanding uh, the world, uh, in the, the natural world, nature, um, environment, and um, the fact that we live in a very pluralistic interfaith society world, how does process theology engage us with all that? Alright? Okay. <laughs> <laughs>